Aloha, and welcome back to Politics and Land in Hawaii with Dennis Isaki on Think Tech Hawaii. Today we'll be speaking with Ricky Cassidy, prominent Hawaii real estate specialist, among other things. He's often uh, called upon by the press and government officials uh, and developers with uh, respect to housing developments. He is a uh, part Native Hawaiian and attended Punahou, Hawaii Prep Academy, and other uh, major colleges, although I didn't see any documentation. Ricky, welcome to Politics and Land in Hawaii on Think Tank. Please tell us a little more about yourself and your involvement with land and housing. Ricky? Well, I, thank you, Dennis. Uh, you and I have been friends for a while. Uh, you're always controversial and you always ask probing questions, so it's a pleasure <laughs> to try and think on my feet. But um, as uh, you know, as you look back uh, over our relationship, it was based on land because as a surveyor, you took uh, good care of the land that my great grandmother has up here on Kauai. Uh, going back from that, which is which started in 2007, 30 years ago, I started doing housing research for major developers, uh, Castle and Cook and Gentry, uh, and then went out on my own uh, afterwards, uh, hung up my shingle, and um, 30 years of, of working for most landowners, most big developers, builders, uh, public agencies, uh, and uh, that includes the feds, HUD, that sort of thing. Um, and then, yes, I've been a trustee for 35 years, first for my stepfather, Henry Luce III, uh, whose father started Time Magazine, and then for Mary Lucas, who um, my dad formed this trust over 100 years ago. Um, when I uh, look back at um, what drives me, uh, it is the case growing up here, I was a surfer and I just loved what was. Uh, dad made sure that I left the islands uh, one way or the other, actually it was my own choice, but it was a hard one because he said you couldn't understand Hawaii until you leave it. And so uh, that's when I went to Washington, D.C., went to university, lived in London for three years, came back to D.C., lived in San Francisco, and then finally came back to Hawaii where I scrambled to get a job, Gentry Homes hiring me. Now that was right at the start of the affordable housing policy, uh, which was, you know, um, well, I look back, it, I, I'd say it starts about 1980, which HHFTC, uh, which in part was land reform, which as you remember, had to do with uh, land monopolies. Uh, my great grandmother did have a small land monopoly up in Niu, uh, leasehold um, fee simple. It wasn't fee simple, it started leasehold and then dad uh, converted it uh, to fee simple in order to pay death duties. So when my grandmother, great grandmother died, uh, so I, I have some experience with leasehold. I have some experience with development. Uh, as I come to you today, what you really wanted to do is say, um, you know, hey, Ricky, what is uh, going on with politicians and, and housing? He threw in land. Land you have to have because that's the basis of wealth. Uh, that's the start of any project um, because that's supposed to have value now in affordable housing. Um, land cannot have value if you want to build affordable housing. Okay, Ricky, Ricky, Ricky let, okay, let me ask the question. No. Uh, why is affordable housing the number one uh, issue today? With politicians, they all talk about that. Is it, than, uh, hmm. is it business or policy or the market? Well, politicians want to get elected. They want to mirror what the concerns of their constituents are. And over the 80, the, over the 30, 40 years that it's been in place, the, they haven't solved it to the satisfaction of their constituents. They may never do that because land in Hawaii is limited. Uh, this is an election year, so they talk about it and they come up with solutions. And you have a wide range of different types of solutions uh, based on whether the person seeing it comes from a policy or political background uh, in which they see things just as, oh, let's regulate it, let's set up a, a, a set of rules and make them go. Um, the other point of view is is a profit. Uh, you can't make anything without profit. 
um, the government does take some of its uh, revenues and cross subsidizes um, housing uh, with our taxes. Uh, and then the way I look at it is it's a market. It has to function, free market. Um, now, housing is not free. It's the most overregulated industry that I can think of. Uh, and so in regulation and in politics, I was trying to balance um, getting the biggest bang for the buck as well as getting elected. You mentioned uh, HFDC. Um, I was on one of the original boards when when they um, started Kapolei. Uh, probably got the history of that. But I remember the market study at that time, they showed only several thousand uh, demand. A much lower than the actual demand, but you know, and AAA uh, is booming now. And uh, were you involved with uh, AAA development? AAA was a giveaway by Dad's. Um, Dad was a trustee at the Campbell Estate, and he gave it away in order to get um, the rest of um, the regulations for the city of AAA, the commercial and industrial stuff. And it was a smart move for a landowner because they developed their property and may up, up valued it by dint of all of that. Uh, it was early days and some of the regulations on it were uh, inexact. The one thing I want to mention to people is that when affordable housing started, and I wasn't at, at Campbell, I was at Castle and Cook, there used to be fights uh, breaking out for people who got in line to, pay, to, to buy a house because you could only have so many houses. So uh, you put out 60 houses, and if you number 61 in line, uh, your interest, which was a monetary benefit of $100,000, would be to cut in line and take 59 and, and, and make him 60, that sort of thing. Um, that's the basic reality of, of, of affordable housing. There is a benefit. How do you, you know, what is it? Uh, how do you generate it? Uh, and how do you share it? So, because housing in Hawaii is such a profitable, put it another way, because there's such a big demand for land in Hawaii on which you can enjoy one of the highest quality of lives in the world, um, you got just tons of people crowding in here to buy. And um, at the same time, you have locals feeling crowded out uh, by all these other people buying, including themselves, because Lots of locals are investors as well as homeowners uh, because it makes some money. Yeah, you know, still sticking with uh, that time with HF, original HFDC, the legislature uh, mandate, mandated, what was it, the Land Use Commission, 60% affordable, uh, you know, for the developers getting land use uh, change approval. and. They went in for Act 15, which is a fast track for affordable. But the thing is, it in, included the you know the quote low income, but it had market homes too. So I think that they you know expedited some of the market homes, which we don't have today. Um, you see anything like that workable? Uh, not there's not a couple, the 60%, though. No, there's a couple parallels. Yeah. One would be, yeah. why did you choose 60%? Because other yeah. times it's been 70%. Yeah. It, was, it was like the way they chose which of the vacation rentals, how many there should be. It, it wasn't based on data, and that's often the case. It, it was guys getting in a room and saying, we got to pass something out. So that's, that's number one. Uh, the, you know, policy at the start was not data-driven, and it's not that much anymore, although there's a lot more to it. The other thing is that 70, what, what a 60-40 split would mean is that the 60% sold at market would have to subsidize the 40%. And usually the, um, there's, there, you lose money on, on your 30%. Uh, you break even on your 60% and you kind of make a little money, but not a market return on your 80%. Now, these are all the different flavors of affordable housing, which makes it a hard thing to talk about. But if you just follow the money and say, you know, how much money do you need to produce the most affordable housing? 
then that's a good basis for um, setting policy because um, the, the private sector is gonna say, this is how much it costs and we're not gonna lose money. And the public sector is gonna say, well, this is how much we have and it can't solve the whole problem. So, you know, let's negotiate over a, um, a term sheet that includes shared appreciation buyback and uh, that sort of thing. Now, all the early stuff um, in the early days has been evolving as any body of regulations does in, in a political context so that the next year you tweak it this way, tweak it that way. Uh, up until a couple of years ago, it had gotten tweaked so bad by um, just an onerous level of, of uh, regulations and regulators uh, that it was very hard for uh, affordable housing really wasn't doing very well. They're, they're, and then I think EGA came in and um, part of the problem was was that recession. We had the Lehman thing where the legislature raided all the money in, in the housing fund to pay for other social services. Uh, never really recovered that until just, you know, last five, 10 years. Uh, and then now we've, we, it's flipped around so that now we have a ton of money and what do we do with it? So my fear is that we're not gonna be judicious. Uh, and, uh, and and not get the best bang for our buck, meaning the, the most amount of affordable housing for the most amount of people. Um, the uh, the income class that's really hurting is the is the workforce guys because they don't get yeah. any subsidies. Yeah, so that, they, well, you know, I call it the, the middle class. We got. Um... Like with with that split, that and uh, one, both like you say, subsidizing the other. I think that worked a little bit. I think the big issue is the government regulations and the time it takes. You know, like worked on uh, we just worked on one project. You know, the Kapakai analysis. We got what so 180 page report in the summit on top of everything else. It, you know. It's a lot of time uh, to the developers, you know, for housing. Time is money, and you know, during that time, people are out of houses. And it costs the cost goes up and up. Like Oakland, it takes four months to go through the process. In San Francisco, twenty three months. And Hawaii is one of the most regulated. And um, the problem there is is there's so many layers, and it's hard to get down to uh, the actual part of that organization that's doing it and get them to change because uh, most organizations like to regulate. It gives them uh, something to do, uh, their reason for being. Um, and the other problem is that uh, whoever's doing it is being seen to take away um, something that was supposed to be good. Now, uh, it's pretty easy to show it's bad to uh, to increase the cost of housing. Uh, but a lot of times what happens is that um, the idea that um, has a negative uh, impact, impact is the new uh, word that I'd like everybody to use because every time you propose uh, or look at a regulation or, or propose it, uh, you ought to ask what the impact is. And for instance, there's a, uh, uh, piece of law passed this uh, session saying that all affordable housing parking should be fully wired for electric cars. And the parking, as you well know, is a huge cost of affordable housing and prevents a ton of more affordable housing. Uh, and um, if you give up a little parking, you get a lot more units at a lot different price points. So for the benefit of forcing uh, you to wire the whole parking lot for what two percent, three percent of the cars may be electric. I mean, how many Teslas are there going to be in an affordable housing project? Don't do that. Rather, you put it next to um, public transportation on the premise that um, people making fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year and sending their uh, kids to school for ten thousand or whatever, um, they just don't have that kind of money. And if they were to take that what they earn and, and buy a car, then they can't afford regular housing, which 
you know, actually is a better deal for them because then they could build equity. And, um, uh, you know, so uh, certain regulations are bad, but so a lot of the politicians this time around are just running on, you know, the campaign of, of cut red tape, cut red tape, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm happy to do that, but I would be, I would counsel them, you know, hey, what makes a democracy great is when people have a goal. And if your goal is affordable housing, you ought to figure out how to increase the supply. Yes, regulation will help it, but um, you ought to do something that lowers the cost, makes more event, more land available, and uh, is sustainable, you know, because in 30, 40 years, you know, you, you don't want to be stuck with something like uh, a field of, uh, of affordable housing parking when instead of electric cars, we now have helicopters. So, so are you saying that uh, you're in favor of more housing in Kaka'ako, uh, you know, that dense development there as opposed to a new Kapolei? Yeah, good question. Um, Here's my spin on that. I want as much affordable housing next to the rail stations along the whole rail line that um, then gives uh, the people living there uh, cheap, easy transportation all over the place and it cross subsidizes um, rail because you're going to get ridership. And, um, you know, it, it will build out the rail. The rail needs to go to Koalina because a ton of people work in Koalina needs to go a little bit further, blah, blah, blah. Kaka'ako is set up to do that, but Kaka'ako is in uh, the area where it costs a ton of money just to put a shovel in the ground, and therefore any little inch uh, is, look at the impact. You know, do, my cost-effective um, solution is run, run the rail to Koalina where everybody goes to work. Uh, they can go from Kalihi or Kaka'ako uh, rather than take it you know, at 10 times the price to Ala Moana and beyond. So, so that's, so, that's, that's one reason. So the people working at Polina gonna be living downtown and catching the train out there? Well, if you put in the two more hotels and then another 4,000 homes on the resort itself, and then on top of that, um, Kalailoa Hunt has all that land uh, that's empty. Okay, that's low cost land and that equates to affordable housing, whether it's regulated affordable or just affordable market housing. But, and, but that's what I'm saying, you know, you can build some there, you kind of put yeah. all in on in Kaka'ako. Yeah. That, if, if and when the rail gets built. It's much easier to make a case for the rail to be built going past East Kapolei when you have, you know, jobs and, and people living there. You want them to go both ways. So yeah, you're, you, you asked a good question. Is it Kaka'ako or, or uh, Kalailoa Kapolei? I'd say both. Yeah, okay. That's a good answer, I think. We got, uh, you know, now uh, on Kauai, we see a lot of uh, billionaires, <laughs> put it bluntly, buying large parcel of land here. Um, some, some of them buy full subdivisions and unsubdivided, uh, getting less for the local. Do, do you see uh, come no and I think it was in the 80s that Kenshiro Kawamoto came here and bought a whole property. Everybody was up in uh, that uproar. But yeah. uh, you know, now all the realtors are jumping for joy, you know, get big big bucks. Anything to say about that? Uh, yeah, I'd probably upset a bunch of people because uh, it's <laughs> easy to do. Um, the truth of the matter is, again, going back to the de desirability, Hawaii is a magnet for wealthy people that crowd locals out. And the mechanism uh, by which you take the benefits or, or the reality of that, but also the benefits of tourism, because it's, it's the same thing. How do you judiciously give a, um, a great visitor uh, experience in the hotels as well as, as support the second homeowners uh, and get the biggest bang out of them 
to give to locals for affordable housing, school, it, you know, all the good things. Rich people usually are pretty generous, um, it, but the, their problem is is they set themselves apart from everybody else, and and that that isn't the local experience. I mean, the more the merrier. We, uh, I have a group Thursday Thursday where we all sit and talk and yell at each other. And and what you want uh, going forward is venues like that where uh, rich people at Kikui will look and share with local halals or whatever. Um, and it's not going to happen if locals are suffering uh, poor quality of life um, and and feel it. They're, you know. The, um, so I, I, you know, the market reigns in 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 free land. Uh, it, politics can take uh, political land, government land, like under the schools. I mean, like Kalihi has three schools on Mayor Wright, uh, and and nobody's living there. Um, there's a bunch of agencies, counties, um, that just hold on to their land and don't share it. No, you can't use it. It's just sitting fallow, and it looks like, looks like, looks like, uh, and it doesn't serve anybody. Um, so going forward, yeah, I need a mechanism to uh, take the benefits, um, do an impact analysis. Get where's the biggest benefit? The biggest benefit comes out of tourism and and second homeowners. That that's 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 our industry. Um, you know, if you want to diversify, you do something off of that, kind of like movies. But uh, whatever the benefits you can get, and you can see tax propositions on this island um, saying, Let, let's up the tax on these guys, uh, which is a good idea. But then at the same time, if you then run around and um, say, cut the number of vacation rentals like they're doing on a while, you lose that tax income and you don't have the, 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 the gasoline. Uh, to run a good policy. Do you see uh, any downturn coming in the future? Yeah, I see uh, uh, inflation, interest rates uh, jacking on up. Uh, Russia and China are showing, you know, they can be crazy. Um, if they don't go crazy, I, you know, the, the world can moderate. We, we, um, Printed money to get out of the COVID, and and now that we're on the other side of it, we have all these asset bubbles, and and housing is one of them. So, housing is is the topic of of you know the day because of of interest rates going up and the prices going up. Now, uh, if I was, uh, yeah. now if if I wanted if I could play God, I'd say let's do a sustainable housing policy. Let's look at what. Uh, you, you, where you can have an effect. One of the effects is they gave all the money to DHHL. And uh, my hope is that that is used in a way uh, that you look out through three or four generations and you say, what we do now uh, will benefit those people. You deal with the declining blood quantum of the constituency. So you're gonna have to lower that. Uh, you have to deal with, um, taking the money and, and putting it in DHH land that'll earn a return like they have out in Kapole with the um, De Bartolo Shopping Center. It's the only one they have. They're starting someone, something uh, in town as well. Um, my fear is that all that money is, is uh, under the guise of, 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 of we're doing something, uh, will not be vetted for its cost effectiveness. Now, having said that, if you want to get elected, um, my premise is that people want will will support a positive goal, like putting a man on the moon. America got behind uh, behind, and the same can be done here. But we have a skeptical public. We look at politicians. We look at landowners. Um, we look at tourists, um, and we go out. You know. Uh, I just uh, look at the history. I, I don't feel like things have gotten better, um, which is why usually big changes happen when things get worse, and then you know, radical things happen. We, uh, you mentioned uh, China and Russia recently. Uh, there's a Chinese 
Chinese developer was it uh, they're selling their property uh, is it Macau? Yeah, they sold it to Stanford, or they sold it. Stanford Car was developing it. And now he'll now that they have a replacement developer. Uh, Macau is a good place to live. I think that's. I like that place. Yeah. Okay, and um, you know, you saying because of uh, inflation and all that, but then what about the other hand? The stock market goes down, so won't they be investing in real estate instead? Well, yeah, when um, when all the asset classes from stocks, bonds um, go up, usually real estate gets uh, put into it. Now, um, when stocks and bonds go up, what you usually see is is the real estate that appeals to the emotions for rich people uh, getting snapped up. When the market goes down, they go to real estate for income, so industrial properties uh, in a, in a good industry. So uh, that's what makes real estate just interesting because uh, cause it lasts forever. And, um, you know, it can generate a different income stream depending on the use and depending on, on the age. But yeah, in, uh, people are trying to buy industrial land like crazy for the income. Yeah, it's uh, keeping you busy on your marketing side. That, well, uh, yeah, we are uh, running out of time. You got uh, we got about a minute left. Uh, you got any uh, famous last words? Well, I want people to be thoughtful, not not just the politicians, but the people voting for them ought to look at the character of the politicians, their orientation, their effectiveness. Uh, they ought to think in the long run, because clearly, you know, uh, the tide goes in and out. But uh, those of us who are in Hawaii, want to be here forever, and want our kids to be here forever, and we want a quality of life to last forever. If we don't take care of that, um, then yeah. Uh, so if I was a you know politician, I'd shoot for the moon, but I'd make it cost effective. Check the impacts. So, so are you running for office anytime soon? If I did, I would support the middle class. Uh, and I would say, these are the guys that need help. And then I'd rationalize a bunch of um, government land ownerships and policies, including the one you mentioned about regulation. Okay, so, but, but you're not running now. <laughs> I, just kidding. <laughs> I, 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 I have made <laughs> a lot of people laugh when I told them I was gonna run for OHA and uh, that my, um, my intent was to run, but not get elected because um, I'd probably be a bad administrator, but the <laughs> attractiveness of, of talking policy, which you've seen me do now for 70% of this program is, is great. And I, I do it because I think about this. I want other people to, to, to think. Okay, thanks, thanks for your uh, insight there. <laughs> we, uh, mahalo to our wonderful guest, Ricky Cassidy. And mahalo to the viewers on Think Tech Hawaii. If you like the Think Tech free media shows, please help support this nonprofit platform with a donation. Aloha, mahalo, ahoi ho, alama pono. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.